Hey my friends, it's Brian. How are y'all? Hope everything's going well for the most part. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit today about the concept of shame. I had once had someone ask me, uh, what's the difference between guilt and shame? And uh, these two feel similar, uh, but I thought it would be worth just kind of defining them. Uh, guilt being when you violate a like a rule or a law when you feel like you did something wrong uh, it could be anything from like breaking the law or maybe it could even be you know if you um, if you have a clumsy moment and you spill your coffee in the morning maybe you feel uh, you know you know guilty in the sense that oh I should be more careful I should pay attention to what I'm doing something like this you you know you feel like uh, you know you should maybe uh, I should you know be better with time management so I'm not rushing or or whatever so you have these like kind of internal uh, rules and mores that, that you kind of broke. And so maybe you feel guilty. You did something wrong. That's the sense. Um, but shame is a little bit different. It, it feels kind of the same. Maybe embarrassment. Uh, emotionally, it, it's similar. But it can really be like um, from a situation where you didn't do anything wrong. So maybe someone spills their coffee on you. <laughs> so then, you know, on your shirt or your slacks or whatever, you, you know, you kind of have people noticing that you have uh, egg on your face, as they may say, or, you know, coffee on your shirt. Uh, you feel embarrassed, you know, it's not uh, your intention, it's not how things are supposed to be, and so you feel that sense of embarrassment. Well, one thing I want to bring up when it comes to standing for your marriage, if you decide to, you know, put that wedding ring on, uh, you never really know. Um, it may be a reminder to other people or people may ask you often, oh, are you married? And, you know, it, depending, it takes some figuring out about how to handle that um, without the long-winded explanation. Some people don't want to hear all that. But eventually some folks figure out that, uh, you know, you are divorced and you may not want that to be public knowledge, but you're kind of making it public knowledge by if you decide to wear your ring and and, you know, make it public that you're not on the market, that, uh, you know, you are in a committed relationship and you're committed to, you know, trusting God, like I talked about before, and working things out with your, your covenant spouse or, um, or your, your wife, your ex-wife, your current wife or husband, uh, if you're separated, whatever, without all those details, that you're still, you're committed to them, you're not on the market, and so you're wearing your ring, but then... Uh, people may find out your situation, some of the details. And uh, so that might be tough. Well, I ran across this verse in Hebrews, the book of Hebrews. You can check it out. Uh, it simply says that um, Jesus uh, also dealt with shame. That um, the whole bit with the, uh, the crucifixion, it, it refers to the crucifixion about how... Um, he actually scorned the shame. So some of the reasons he might have felt shamed is, well, uh, he was publicly embarrassed. He, you know, he was, um, you know, on trial, public trial. Um, he was, you know, according to the, the government officials and all that, found guilty, um, you know, beaten up, dragged through the streets. And uh, I think if you do a little research, it was a common practice for uh, folks that died by crucifixion to die uh, naked and that they would have been kind of posted uh, at like a central, uh, like near the front gate when you were coming into the major cities, that this is where you would see these criminals. Kind of as a spectacle to say, hey, you know, you don't want to end up like this. Kind of a reminder to everybody else, I guess, made an example of, you could say. So the verse says that uh, scorning the shame um, of the cross and his whole situation, that he kept in mind the joy that was set before him, meaning that he was able to kind of walk through, deal with the embarrassment, deal with some of the short-term whatnot. Ugh. Oh, uh, sorry, the lights went out. Uh, here where I live, we have uh, some load shedding from time to time. Sorry about that, you guys, but it'll jump back on just in a second. You'll be able to see me. I'll just continue on until it does, no big deal. The, um, the thing was, he, he had this greater goal in mind, and you might ask, well, what was that goal? Well, one was that he, I think he was bought into the, the bigger plan, um, his, his father's kind of plan for um, 
the you know the redemption of mankind for the good of humanity um, for the reconciling of people to God and so he knew that that was going to come at a high price but he kind of looked at everything and he said that price is worth it to me and it's going to be tough but yeah I'm in it um, you know this is really similar to uh, our situations in a lot of ways because there may be a lot of a lot of things that actually we can see uh, it's worth it to us for the joy set before us. So one, um, you know, you may have been hurt by your your spouse or your, um, or your ex, but the thing is, you know, I was struck recently. There is a lot of things that we can really say, uh, you know, wow, um, they're you know the reasons that we fell in love with them, the things that we like about them, the things that you know we want to see like develop in their lives, the the dreams that. We knew that they had, that we would like to see them accomplish those things. And, you know, uh, sometimes if we just really realize, you know, it's pretty incredible if your spouse is a believer and, and you're, you're standing for them. If they're not a believer, I've talked about that in other videos, how you're not necessarily uh, required to uh, stay in the fight for them. You do have that freedom to leave. But if your spouse is a believer, you got to really realize, man, you know, um, they've probably been through some tough things. Everyone has. And they definitely had the option to kind of, uh, you know, just say, well, forget Christianity or go do this or get sucked into this thing, that thing or the other thing. And, uh, you know, and if they haven't done that, you know, if they've still at some points in their life still been, you know, uh, seeking God, trying to grow as people. Um, and then, you know, that this has been a tough trial for you as a couple. Well, that's fine. But I mean, you can still really think, wow, you know, there's a lot of things that I really admire and love about this person. And yes, there's whatever the circumstances or the, the things that kind of disrupted the relationship uh, for the time being, there's still those qualities that they have that, that you like, the things that, uh, you know, of course, being human and normal and having, you know, all the normal stuff people deal with, but still, there's a lot there. So that's like one thing that you can really grab hold of and say, you know, this is kind of part of my joy is that I appreciate this person. I understand that they're human. I understand that relationships are tough, that their work, that people get hurt, that people get discouraged and leave and give up and want to try again and try different things and that we're all learning kind of as we go through life. But that's one thing. The other thing um, that I think is really cool is uh, I think it means a lot to our father, you know. I think that, um, you know, like I said, that he's not so excited in any way, shape, or form about divorce, or the breaking up of marriages and families. And so he's excited that you have the faith to believe that he's going to actually work in their life, that he hears your prayers, that uh, that's a big testimony of how far he's brought you. And so to see you walking, to see, for him to see you walking in those things, to be believing, to be struggling, to be growing in your faith. And it struck me, you know, it's a different thing. It's one thing to say, you know, God, forgive me my sins. I know that I, I've messed up a lot and I haven't always followed you and I haven't always believed in you. But, you know, God, I accept the, the sacrifice of your son and I need that. And I'm really looking forward to like all the ways that you're going to come into my life, both now and in eternity. That's going to be awesome. I'm really excited about that. That's one level of faith. There's a different kind of thing when you're really banking, say, the next five to ten years of your life on God stepping into the picture, you know. Uh, we kind of think that once you die, I mean, it's kind of all the choices are kind of out of your hands. You kind of, it just goes on from there. At least that's how I think about it. But with life, I mean, you're thinking, you know, if God doesn't step up and, and help me out in this situation, nothing's going to happen. And that's a whole other thing that I think... Um, he loves to have us trust him on that level. The third thing, and I'll say this really quickly, is you know if you've ever been excited about your faith and what you've experienced as a as a Christian, and then you try to talk with other people about that and it just doesn't ring true. You know they're just not interested or they don't get it. Well, there's one thing <clears throat> in the scriptures that talks about always be ready to have an answer when someone asks you for this hope that you have in God. Well, I'm telling you, when you put that ring on and people try to start figuring out why it is that you believe in your spouse, believe in God, believe in family the way you do, people will start coming to you and then you'll have really cool opportunities that you might not have had before. So those are some things to think about when it comes to shame and overcoming it. Thanks, you guys. We'll talk to you later. Bye.